<clears throat> hey, is there anybody in the um, in the class that has a computer or a phone or something? Or both? All right, can you go to the syllabus for the class for today's lecture and click play on the video and just make sure that there's audio and that it's actually working? That way I won't have to keep asking the people at home if they can hear me since they probably already gave up by now since we took so long. On YouTube? Yeah, on YouTube? It's like yeah. YouTube, but you're, you mean like there's something else that's going to make you hear me, so we can't like respond. Yeah, there's no way People have responded, though. They have. I don't have it. Just type a comment. It should work. Oh, you have to like open it in YouTube. You can't view, be viewing it in the page. Yeah, if you have it on the slide, you probably can't comment. But if you if you click open in YouTube, I'm sure you can comment. Because people have commented and said things like, no, we can't hear you. All right, so can you hear me? We're good? All right, outstanding. Thank you guys for all your patience. Um, I had a cool... Sometimes when I put it in the slide, it chops off part of the uh, the YouTube preview there. Um, so let me see if I can get there. So who has ever? Anyway, you can you can click on the YouTube video, video later. Who has ever been so annoyed, so angry that they've uh, that they've picked up a chair? and slammed it back down on the floor such that the chair broke. Anybody in this room? Besides me, I have done it. In fact, there's more than one repaired chair in my house. Turns out I have some carpentry skills, so I always put them back together. That, and it's that instant release that, that gets me to be like, ah, oh, shit, I shouldn't have done that. But who's ever done it? Anybody else broken a chair? You've broken a chair because you're angry? Yeah. Anybody else broken something because they were angry? You've broken something? Who? Anybody who has not broken something because they were angry? You're, you're a special person to have not broken something. Now, maybe it's genetic because both of my kids break stuff when they're angry. Uh, maybe it's learned behavior. Because that the, the chair I'm thinking of, in fact, the, I, I can still visualize it too. I can visualize picking up the chair and slamming it down on the floor. And it was to make a point. Because my daughter wasn't listening to me. Now, it was a poor method for making the point, right? But I think we can all relate to the desire. I have this recurring desire when I get mad of smashing stuff with a baseball bat. I have never in my life smashed something with a baseball bat, including a baseball. I've struck out many times. I've grounded out. I've popped out, but I have never smashed the baseball. <laughs> but I have this recurring vision of when I get angry of like taking a baseball bat and oh, that chair, there wouldn't be enough pieces to glue back together. Um, Sometimes it happens at work. I've learned, actually, this is a life lesson for everybody. Pay attention. Not on the topic of today's lecture, but, but I have learned that laughing about it has way more positive impact than smashing a chair. And, uh, and I will teach you from my life experience that if you're going to laugh about it someday, who's ever had those moments where you're like, someday we're going to laugh about this? We've all had those moments, right? We all, we all know that someday we're going to think this is funny. If you could say someday I'm going to laugh about this, just laugh now. Because you might as well. There's nothing else you could do, right? You could cry. You could cry or you could laugh. And if you could cry or you could laugh, you might as well laugh. It makes your, uh, your health better. You don't die as young. Laughter, laughter actually extends your life. So I hope I heard some of you guys laugh during this soliloquy. Um, <laughs> I hope that you live longer because of it. But here's the thing at work. I mean, besides like office politics and stuff, office politics is stupid. 
Nobody should participate. However, you should win if you get sucked into it. <laughs> um, besides office politics, which I have now stopped getting upset about, the thing that really pisses me off is, is so our, my, my wife and I own a manufacturing business. We often get drawings sent to, to the company. Luckily, I don't have to do day-to-day -day stuff anymore. I don't have to um, sort of respond to the drawings and make sure that they're working. The screen probably went black because I didn't plug in my extra extension cord and now I have to keep wiggling the mouse to keep the uh, computer from going to sleep. But um, I once had a $200,000 purchase order. $200,000 purchase order sounds pretty good when the company does a million dollars in revenue at the time, right? $200,000 is a significant percentage of the annual sales. That And the customer is a billion dollar company. And they've been in business for a long time and they are the prime customer of the business. $200,000 purchase order. Nobody in the world had ever made the part that they wanted made. It was one of the hardest materials in the world to machine. The first $25,000 of the purchase order was to make the first part. $25,000 to make one piece and develop the process. They knew it was hard to do. In fact, they also do machining of this material and they knew that their machine shop couldn't make the part because they had been trying for months and they hadn't successfully made one. $25,000 to make the first part and then $200,000 or $175,000 to deliver the rest of the parts over some period of time. So you got to be careful when you make the first part, right? Because what does the customer want? They want good parts. They don't want crap. $25,000 part better be a good part. So you're stopping and checking all of the stuff along the way. You're, you're testing different things on scrap material to make sure the process works the way you think it should work. And so when you stop and test, so you got to take the, the designer's drawings to do your measurements against, right? That's, that's the whole purpose of the designer sending you a drawing with tolerances and dimensions and stuff on it. Because they could send you a solid model file, which we didn't get in this case. We just got a drawing. We got like a PDF file of a drawing. Um, they, anyway, the guy that was doing the, the setup... He gets to the second to last feature we're going to make on the part. By, by the way, the part's like this big around and less than a quarter of an inch thick. And the material that it's made out of, to make a piece of that material, it costs $100,000 to turn the reactor on. <laughs> now, they make a giant piece of material that gets cut up into smaller pieces, but it costs $100,000 to start the process of making the material. And... You don't know if the material is any good until you finish machine it, until you've made it down, because it could be an internal stress. There could be a stress fracture that you can't see from the outside. Uh, maybe you could x-ray it and find those cracks, but typically the cracks don't even appear until you've machined it to close to the near net shape, and then you can see the crack. And then that piece of material, which maybe costs $10,000, you have to throw it away because you can't make that part out of it. You can make two smaller parts. It's not like we throw it away, throw it away. We just put it on a shelf. But um, anyway, we're two steps away from the finished part. And there's a question about one of the tolerances on the drawing. And uh, the, the guy that's got to do the setup and do the, uh, do the inspection, he's like, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what they want here. There's two different ways to interpret this tolerance, and we could make this feature to meet either way, but we can't make it to meet both ways. So that's confusion, right? And so the purpose of the art part of design is to design parts, and then, so you, you wanna have the customer need fulfilled. The, um, the end part was part of a machine that makes um, the chips that go in iPhones. So it wasn't an iPhone. It wasn't even the chip that goes in the iPhone. It was part of one of the machines that they use to make the chips that go in iPhones. That was the, uh, the, the end customer. And, and we're working for the material manufacturer 
who couldn't machine their own material to make the shape. It's a question about which way should we interpret this tolerance? Now, if they had done good GD and T, if they had made a good drawing, uh, somewhere in here there's a good drawing. Oh, wait. If they had made a good drawing and clearly represented all of the information that the manufacturer needed on the good drawing, then there would have been no interpretation problem. We would have made the part shipped it. Here's, here's where the moment comes up. It's in the conversation with the engineer from the customer who is not the end customer, but they're the people that they're my customer. And, uh, and so I called him up and I said, uh, hey, we're having trouble with this feature on the part. And he said, wait a minute. Oh, send me the drawing you're working from. That's what I did. He said, oh, that's an obsolete drawing. That feature doesn't exist on the part. We redesigned the part. And then we issued you a $200,000 purchase order to make the part based on an obsolete drawing because we sent you the wrong drawing. Those are moments when you want to smash something, right? <laughs> Billion dollar company, biggest customer. It's not like you can say, well, hey, you need to send us another $25,000 to get started, right? You can't say that if you... Anyways, so those are moments. And so manufacturers, that's sort of an extreme example, but it happens every day. Every day manufacturers get drawings from customers I, I know lots of people that own these kind of machine shops that, uh, that do this kind of thing. And every day they get these kind of um, drawings from their customers and they can't make the part, not because they can't make it, because they don't actually know what the customer wanted. And so that's the purpose of geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is to, um, to share Are you still logged into the YouTube? Just, is it, am I screen sharing? I, I don't even know. I lost track. Maybe I can figure it out. It says sharing something here, but in StreamYard, it's just me, right? Hi, Mom. Um, share. Share screen, share, share. Now I'm, now I'm sharing, right? And the people at home can see what I'm sharing and we'll go ahead and go, let me go to the presentation view of this. If I click on lecture slides here, it'll open up. And now maybe it won't time out, I don't know. All right, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Uh, so one time I gave this lecture, and um, for some reason, <laughs> where's that chair? <laughs> well, we know how to fix it because I can't click anything to make it go away. So we'll just let it progress, and then we'll make it come back. Oh, 9947, 9947. Um, I, I, I struggle with this lecture. Uh, and I struggle with this lecture because who, who's heard of this before? Who's heard about GD&T? Oh, oh, by the way, one time I gave this lecture and I, my mind, I don't know, mind blank, too much drugs back in the 80s. I don't know what it was. I said gauging, dimensioning, and tolerancing. It's totally geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. It's not gauging. Although gauging is important because it it's how you measure the dimensions and know whether or not you've hit the tolerances. But yeah, so, uh, so it's, it's totally possible to make mistakes. Um, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing is the tool that we use as designers to convey information to the, uh, to the manufacturers. If we don't do it correctly, somebody loses a lawsuit. Um, it's in, and 
you can refer to any GD&T standards you want to. So in your, uh, in your drawing, con command tab, where's the thing? Oh, come on, I, I opened that on purpose before I came here. I didn't see it. Camera, source, number five. Hey, I picked it right. In your, uh, in your drawing, somewhere down here, oh, somewhere on the drawing, you're allowed to say which standard you referenced for your GD&T. <coughs> anyway, this is an ANSI drawing. So this is an American standard drawing. Is that upside down? No. Okay, good. Um, this is an ANSI standard drawing. You, you, you tell the manufacturer which standard you used. Now, the standards get published every few years. Uh, in fact, the publisher of the standard, I'm on one of these standards committees, and we, we, we write these standards, and um, the publisher, the people that put on the meetings, bring us all together to talk about um, geeky engineering stuff that we're going to then debate whether the word meaning when we write the standard... Scam likely. Don't answer that one. Um, it's a publishing company. Their job is to sell books, right? All companies want to make a profit, so they want to sell books. So even if the standard's okay, even if there's nothing wrong with it, every few years you have to publish a new version. That makes sense? Because if our business model is sell books, we need... And who's ever bought a textbook at school? Actually, this may be... Maybe no, it's only, it only there's certain there's hands that didn't come up because you don't have to buy textbooks anymore. Typically, you can who's who's rented a textbook. All right, so you guys destroyed the whole textbook market when you you agreed to rent a textbook because the whole model was I need to issue a new edition of my book as the professor so that you the student have to pay me more money to take my class because you need the new edition of the book. You can't use the old edition that your brother or your sister or your roommate had. You need the new edition. And it's, it's totally money grabbing. It's just about, we want more money, uh, which, yeah, we want more money. But um, the standards are the same way, right? We keep issuing new editions. So if you're the designer, and you have the 1996 edition of the standard on your desk, then you're gonna specify the ASME Y14 1996. And then the manufacturer, if they wanna know for sure what you meant, I mean, if they're smart, they just call you. But if, or if it's a billion dollar company and you can't actually talk to the person. In my case, it was, my customer was a billion dollar company and their customer was a hundred billion dollar company, right? So you were never gonna talk to the person who made the drawing. You weren't gonna have that conversation. So you gotta look at the book, see exactly what does it mean, and then you have to meet the letter of the standard if you wanna win the lawsuit. Now, if you wanna have a happy customer, you have to actually give them the thing they need but do it in such a way that it meets the letter of the standard. Otherwise, they may not pay for it anyway. Um, so, so the standard is a set of rules for how we communicate. When you use the standard, you get, to you get to specify which edition of the standard you're using, which year it was published, and, and all those things. And you can put it on the drawing. But it's, it's just a set of rules for how we communicate. So catch-22. I think in Catch-22, there was communication, right? In fact, it was a, the whole book is just people talking to each other, right? And, um, but they were also trying to not die, right? Because it's in the middle of a war. So miscommunicating in that sense could cause you to end up dead, right? Typically in these kind of manufacturing incidents, it could cause you to not get paid for the part, but communication is important. 
and there's rules for communication because they had special terms, right? Like what, what is a catch-22 anyway? It, they, they made this up for the book. It's not, a, well, I guess now it's a real thing. Paradoxical situation, sort of. So right. Conflict is like you want to get discharged, so you want to volunteer for the suicide mission because then they you think you're know, suicidal. You do that, would be insane, so you would right, right. So yeah, so the catch twenty two is you volunteer to do the thing that's going to guaranteed to get you killed, so that they think only a crazy person would volunteer for that. So therefore, we must discharge them. We don't want to have any crazy people in our army, right? Um, did it work? I can't remember. I saw the movie. Oh, you yeah, haven't finished it. I, I can't remember. I, I, I did see the movie, and we did a great scene, and we got an A on the project, but um, it didn't really help anybody. So it's about communicating. It's about using the right words. It's all about learning the jargon and the words. We could. The, the reason I hate this lecture is because we could take seven weeks, 12 weeks, 18 weeks to teach you what you need to do to always be correct when you make the drawing. And we're not going to do that. We're going to talk about it. Well, because of setup time and me goofing around and talking, telling stories, we're going to talk about it for like a half an hour. And so how do I give you enough information in a half an hour so that you're a better engineer when you grow up? So what's GDT based on? What, what's it mean first? Let's get the words right. It's, it, it's about communication, right? So what are the words? Geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Right. So the words are geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. Um, there are more than one standard which define it. There's two primary ones that are in use in the world today. There's the U.S. standard or ANSI standard um, and... Uh, uh, ASME Y14.2, I think. I don't know. Google it. But this is a U.S. standard. And it's written by a ASME group. And these groups are volunteers. Some of them work at universities. Some of them work at companies. Some of them are users of the standard. Some of them are, I guess Y14, everybody's sort of a user. They're either a designer or they're a manufacturer, right? But there's designers on the group. There's manufacturers on the group. And, and we go to hotels in you know, places like New Orleans and Chicago. And we sit there in a conference room in the hotel. And we argue about which word means what. Because somebody else is going to use that standard to defend the fact that, yes, we made the parts our customer asked for. And therefore, our customer has to pay us, even if the parts didn't work. We're proving that their design sucks. Um, I don't recommend suing your customers, uh, but maybe that's just because my business is so small. <laughs> right? I don't, but, but people get away with it. People sue customers, vendors sue customers, customers sue, sue um, each other. But it's about, so, so it's about winning the lawsuit at one level, but really it's about conveying the information. Because if you're the designer, you actually want good parts to be made. You, it's not that you want crappy parts to be made. You want good parts to be made. So it's about how do you communicate the correct information to the manufacturer. Um, again, we could spend months on this. What's the most important thing for you to know about it? So what's a tolerance? So geometric dimensioning, you guys have got that, right? Intuitively, you know what it means? You could draw geometry. And dimensions are things like lengths and widths and heights and things like that. So, and, and you know that features on parts can be located distances away from something, right? So, like, the hole needs to be a certain distance away from something. So, geometric dimensioning, you get the overall concept. And what are tolerances again? We talked about that before several times. So the tolerance is how much can the manufacturer screw up and still make a good part? So what's acceptable to us if they screw up? How do you know what the right tolerance is if you're the designer? So who's ever designed something? 
Who's, who's made a sketch or a drawing that is their idea? Who's ever designed something? Keep your hands up if you put a tolerance or understood that there was a tolerance on the thing you designed. Okay. Keep your hands up if you put the tolerance, didn't just understand. How did you pick your tolerance? All right, so you look at the other parts it's going with. Keep your hands up, by the way, if you're in that state. Uh, well, you can put yours down. I called on you. Right, so you looked at the parts that it had to mesh with, and you made a judgment, or you did math? So you had a standard. And so you like you looked looked up something in a book or something, right? And you referred to that for what the tolerance would be. Okay, who else? Um, how did you pick your tolerance? So I looked at like how much um, the dimensions would be off by, and the, still have the part where with the dimension being off. Okay, so you so so what we call that? He he said he looked at how far the dimension could be wrong and have the part still work. And so we call that functional tolerancing. So, so you, you, you looked it up in a, in a book, like a cookbook, that said if it's this kind of a part, we're going to use this kind of a tolerance. Because how big was the company you worked at? Uh, billion-dollar billion company, yeah, yeah. So billion-dollar companies can afford to make their own books. And they can say all engineers will make parts within this zone. So was it possible to vary from the standard? Oh, it totally was possible. My, my wife works at a $300 billion company, and they can vary from those standards. But there's a lot of writing, and there's a lot of meetings, and there's a lot of vice presidents that have to sign off. And in her case, the FDA has to sign off, right? So, yeah, you don't vary from those standards, but you did functional. What was your part? What was it for? Oh, so you, you actually designed a gauge for measuring whether or not other parts were intolerance. Exactly. So that actually adds another level of complexity, right? right? So because your gauge can have uncertainty. In fact, it will have uncertainty. So your tolerance impacted the uncertainty of the gauge, which then impacted your ability to measure the parts which also had a tolerance that somebody else specified, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, yeah. and probably some billion-dollar company, and they, he looked it up in a book to specify the tolerance for your parts and you worked at a smaller, not a billion dollar company probably? Pretty big, okay. Maybe a billion dollar company. Yeah, it was a big jump from a million to a billion, by the way, a thousand times. Um, but, but yeah, so you did, and, and then you used your gauge product, the thing that you made in house, to measure other people's parts and then ship them to the customer? Yeah. Probably. Did the customer ever not pay? Not so you must have done it right. All right, but you considered the uh, the thing. So um, what did you guys do in, uh, in lab this week? You did assembly of your thermoacoustic engines, right? And so when you did the assembly of your thermoacoustic engines, anybody remember what any of the critical, so we had you measure parts as they came off the machine sometimes, a few of the parts. What were the critical dimensions that we looked at? I've got one of the parts from the engine here in the, one of these slides. Oh, there we go. So that's one of the parts, right? What are, what are the critical dimensions on this part? Yeah. So that oval at the bottom, because it has to go into a pocket that we made on a, on a mating part, right? So the oval at the bottom, what else is important to us when we make this part? Yeah. Uh, and then the problem with the screw holes. That on the top? Yeah. So like the, making sure like the lines were correct for your screw to actually screw in. The threads. Yeah. Was yours the one that they, we re-drilled and re-threaded? Oh, you just threw the part away and got a new one? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't know what happened to your part. It was like the screw would go in towards a certain point, and then just like, no matter what, would not go any further. 
the threads didn't go deep enough, yeah. right? Now the threads by the by the drawing should have gone all the way to the bottom, which meant if we had checked that when we made the part, we would have known immediately you made a bad part. In fact, you probably could have seen that with a visual inspection. You probably could have, if you knew to look for it, right? right? Nobody told you to look for it, so no fault to you. Um, I actually heard a story yesterday about a part that was manufactured by a company that makes, um, well, my dad's a civil engineer. Any, anybody, any civil engineers in here? How many MEs in here? Most of us. So I was this running joke with my dad. I was like, hey, you guys make targets. We make bombs, right? So anyway, this was, um, this was actually a mechanical device that was intended for knocking other mechanical devices out of the air. Um, so it may or may not have been part of an air-to-air -air missile, but uh, <laughs> but I don't know that, so can't can't quote me on the internet. Um, at any rate, so they had a part from a vendor that was coming in, and um, the vendor inspected it, sent it to their customer, who put it into the assembly and inspected it, sent it to the manufacturer who put it in the um, uh, mechanical device that's intended to destroy other mechanical devices, it, but inspected it and put it in there. And then shipped it off to the Air Force, who inspected it. Everybody accepted it, right? Everybody accepted it. Passed functional tests, not just the measurements. Passed functional testing. And a few months later, it was a seal. It was like a, you screw a fitting in and there's a hose connected to it. There's hydraulics and stuff. A few months later, it stopped holding the hydraulic fluid on the inside of the seal, which is a problem because you don't want the stuff to drip out. Might screw up your um, radar fouling paints and stuff like that. If it's got oil and stuff all over it. Um, so it turns out they switched machines that they were making that little fitting on. And they didn't have, they, they screwed up the Z offset on the tap when they switched machines by, you know, like 500 thousandths or something. Not, not, even, not even 500, like 50 thousandths or something. Who knows what the difference was? And, um, and they ran the tap in there and then you could screw the fitting in and you could feel it get tight. Right, because that's that's how you check when you screw the fitting in whether or not it works. You check with a torque wrench, right? And you could see that it compressed the O-ring, but it was actually mashing the bottom of the fitting against the untapped area, which would seal for a little while. But then under pressure, eventually the oil would work its way up through the threads and start coming out through the O-ring, which wasn't actually crushed. Um, so it's easy to make these kind of mistakes. By the way, that's a case where I understand the vendor won the argument. They still got paid. Or that it, it costs like $2.3 million to fix the problem. And the, the vendor had to come up with like 5,000. Because that was like how much it cost to remake the parts that they screwed up. I will. Thank you for interrupting. Uh, anyway, um, so 30 more seconds on GD&T. It's really important. If you don't understand it, you will screw up and you won't make good parts. And we can't possibly explain it in 30 minutes or 47 minutes or whatever we have here in class. Um, so I didn't try. It, it, well, did I explain that it was important? Okay. Um, and that the tolerancing part is important and that you could either look up the tolerances um, in like a book, like the Machinery's Handbook, if you don't work at a multi-billion dollar company, you can get a Machinery's Handbook for free from the library here at WPI or for like 150 bucks. Money well spent. Um, and if you go to the, uh, the syllabus slide for today's lecture and you want to actually learn some details because you'd want to be a designer that does GD and T well, or you want to take someone else's design whether or not they did the gd and t well and at least be able to win the lawsuit because you read the standard correctly and you made the part they asked for 
Uh, this guy has the best YouTube channel for learning gd &T that I have found. And I thought about binging his YouTube videos and learning it as well as he knows it so that I could do this lecture better. But then I realized this lecture is only 40 minutes long. And I couldn't possibly teach you the volume of the stuff that he talks about. And um, and he's sort of between my age and your age, so he might be more relatable than me. Who knows? Anyway, he's got great YouTube skills. You should watch his stuff if you want to learn better how to do GD&T, either as the reader or the writer of the GD&T. All right, so group project. What was the assignment again? I th this is a case where actually I think I remember, but I'm going to go back and look at it. Right, so I always, like, I never write down equations from memory. I might write down what I think the variables in the equation are, but I'll never write it down from memory because I'm not good at remembering stuff like that. But if we scroll up a couple slides here, that's the one where I forgot to click record. You could watch the last time video. Um, where was it that we talked about this? This one, right? Nope. Not that one. It's up further. Must be this one. Nope. Well, I know it's in here. Group project. So this used to be the third group project. I used to make you do a group project where you proved to me that you made a group and you got a point or something towards your final grade for proving to me that you made a group, but you didn't get that point if you weren't actually in the group when you submitted the thing. So, um, and then I did another one. What was the second one? I don't remember what the second one was, but it was more along the lines of prove to me that you've met with your group, right? Because I think those, those are two key steps in doing a group project, create a group, meet with them. And um, I used to think I had to step you through that. Now I sort of just threw you to the wolves. Either you created a group and met with them or you didn't. But uh, what did we ask you to do? You're going to create a company. Now, it's slightly modified from what it says here, right? Because here it says create a company that will make the ME1800 Sterling engine. But I told you guys you could create a company that makes anything as long as you've decided that that's what you want to make. So that's the slight modification for what I've asked for. And, um, and so I ask you to make a, a no longer than four page business plan that includes a budget and that the budget should include the cost to make the first part. And so that means what's the startup cost for creating the business? So what are the things you have to spend money on? What do you have to spend before you can even make a part and ship it to a customer? I think I said the cost, oh, well, in order to do this price point thing, you have to understand what's the cost to make the second part, right? So what's, once you've got started up, what's the cost to continue making these parts? And then, so that cost to make the first part, that's how much money you need to start the business. And then that cost to make the second part, plus what you've decided, you guys, you guys know that you get to pick what the profit is, right? Did you know that? You actually get to choose the price that you sell the thing for. You can choose your profit. Now, if nobody buys it, you didn't choose wisely, right? But you actually get to choose the selling price. It's possible you could have sold it for more and gotten more profit, but you didn't know because you were um, too chicken to increase the price. But, uh, but I had you come up with some sort of sales projections and stuff, and this didn't have to be this is not a marketing class, it's not a business class. It was just like, if this is the price point and we can sell this many, it'll take us this long to pay back the money that we borrowed to create the company, right? So that's not a hardship. Just make it sound sort of believable. Make it sound like you thought about it. And then I think I have some rules in here about the first year you're allowed to pay yourself or not pay yourself. 
and then the following years you must pay yourself or by a certain year you must pay yourself. So all this stuff's laid out in there. So your question is about the rubric, right? How are we going to grade this? So what do you think we should have? Any, any insight? Any requests? I, I know I had papers when I was in college that got graded by you sort of take the stack, stand at the top of the basement stairs and throw them down the stairs. And the one that gets the farthest gets an A and then you sort of sort, we believe that's how the grading happened. The, the professor never told us that was the technique, but we believed that. Um, so here's what I do when I look at these reports. First, I look at like the, the stupid format things. Like, does it look like they cared before they submitted it, right? And so I have never as directly assigned a point value to it, but I would say that that's probably 25% of it. And it's it's not it's not because I want it to be 25% of it, but I'm I'm using my judgment at that moment, right? And if it looks like crap, I'm going to then look harsher at everything else I see. So this is sort of truth in grading, not, not clearly defined rubric, right? So it should look presentable. It should look like you cared. Um, and that's a percentage. It should look like you've addressed the issues that we discussed. And, and so what I'll do is I'll read what you said. So it's going to, you know, so you need things like you need a location. You need to have assessed how much a location is going to cost you. You need to have the equipment. You need to have made a reasonable estimate of what equipment you need to make the parts that you say you're going to make. Right. So if, if you um, if you say you're going to make space shuttles and you bought one Haas machine used at a flea market, I'm not going to believe that you put a reasonable effort into that. But if you tell me that you're going to make uh, widgets for printing presses and you know what the widget looks like and you've said it's going to take these processes to make it and you could make you could make them at this speed with this many machines and that's why we picked that many machines because we want to make them at that speed to sell them at that speed then i'm going to believe that you looked it up um, you can get pricing for machine tools from craigslist or from the manufacturer's website don't ask anybody for a quote please then they're going to think you're actually a customer and they're going to get all excited. They're going to sell a machine, but you're not going to, unless you're actually going to build the shop and um, buy machines. Um, so, so the, the biggest percentage is, did you consider the factors that are going to be important? Um, and, uh, and so facility machines, cost of materials, um, cost of, operating the thing what are reasonable rates for the uh the people that work there and things like that and have you done all this through and calculated it i've seen so for the original assignment the one that was the uh the sterling engine i've seen costs for startup that ranged from 190,000 to 5 million those two different costs didn't get different grades because of the number that they picked. It was how well did you present your argument? How well did you tell me that that's why this is the number? Um, I think the correct number is about a million dollars for that particular part. If you're going to start from scratch, buy the machines and get set up to do it. Um, but it doesn't matter if I think your number is correct. What really matters is, did you consider the things? Um, is that, does that give you enough information or do you want more defined? Um, I'm totally not going to throw them down the stairs because I'm not going to waste the paper by printing them out. And I'm not going to throw the computer down the stairs. I don't think it'll help. But, uh, but I am going to go through, I'm going to say, did you consider all the things? And if you've left out some major things, I'll deduct some points from that. But if you, if you do four pages and it looks good and you have reasonable arguments for what you did, you're going to get an A. If you do 17 pages, you're going to get a C. <laughs> I don't care how good it looks. Last day of the term. 
is there oh and i need to put up a thing where you can submit it because i don't think i put up a thing where you can submit it if that'll be yeah that'll be group assignment one i guess <laughs> uh make sure that you're in the group on canvas before the thing gets submitted otherwise I will still give you credit for it, but I won't like it because I'll have to go back and retroactively do it. Stop sharing. Thank you. Close. Disconnecting. Quit. StreamYard and broadcast.